December 7, 1941, Japan starts its attack on Pearl Harbor. The United States of America declared war on Japan the very next day, and only a few days later, on Germany as well. By that point, the entire scientific community was well aware of the potential applications of a nuclear fission chain reaction, and the Allies were all well aware that the Germans had a massive head start in the development of an atomic weapon. The race for the bomb was on. During the course of the war, every single major Axis and Allied power would start their own nuclear weapon program, but in the end, only one came to be successful. The American industrial complex would prove to be the only one advanced enough to realize a nuclear weapon program before the end of the war. This program came to be known as the Manhattan Project. Although many participants understandably showed great moral qualms about their involvement in the project, it nevertheless represents a remarkable example of engineering, scientific collaboration, and the ability of a nation to harness its resources for a singular goal, to make the most destructive weapon in the history of mankind. When discussing the early stages of the American nuclear weapon program, it is interesting to note that no single decision truly created the atomic bomb project. From the day the einstein zillard letter was sent in August of 1939, the government kept allocating additional funds and created new government bodies relative to what was happening on the ground and as new information kept coming in, until the project crystallized in a coherent structure with clear leadership and a singular goal by the end of 1942. During that time frame, it was agreed that the Army should spearhead the nuclear weapon program, or more specifically, the Corps of Engineers, and that an Army officer should be in overall command of the entire project. On September 17, 1941, the Army appointed Colonel Leslie R. Groves to head the effort. He would be promoted to Brigadier General only six days later in order to have greater authority over the scientists involved. Although the Manhattan Project was undoubtedly a collective endeavor, if one had to pick a single individual that was most responsible for the successful and timely completion of the project, then they would be hard-pressed to pick anyone else but General Leslie Groves. Groves was a West Point graduate with strong administrative abilities, who up to that point was most famous for managing several massive civil engineering projects for the military, including the building of the Pentagon. Throughout his career, he was both famous and infamous for his very aggressive approach, which would prove to be crucial for the atomic bomb project. First, he made sure that the program got the highest possible war priority rating, which enabled him to acquire all the manpower and funding that was necessary. Although there were several feasible methods of producing a bomb, he pushed for their simultaneous implementation in order to make the weapon in the shortest possible time. He ultimately made the decision to move the most important scientific and engineering work to an isolated location in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and he also chose an excellent, though certainly an expected scientific director to manage the work in Los Alamos, J. Robert Oppenheimer. There are several reasons why Oppenheimer wasn't an obvious choice for this position. First of all, he lacked the necessary managerial experience, especially on this scale. Also, to a certain degree, he didn't enjoy the same clout as some of his colleagues, because he lacked a Nobel Prize. But perhaps most importantly, Oppenheimer had a long history of socializing with leftist-leaning circles, and in fact his own brother was a member of the Communist Party, although Oppenheimer himself never was. All of this certainly wasn't left unnoticed by the United States government, and many individuals did not want Oppenheimer deeply involved in the project. But General Leslie Groves almost immediately recognized Oppenheimer's potential and genius and personally pushed for him to spearhead the engineering and scientific effort in Los Alamos. This was mostly possible because communism wasn't viewed as the main threat at the time and there weren't many regulations put in place that would prevent Oppenheimer from advancing his career. The relationship between Groves and Oppenheimer would prove to be instrumental for the success of the project, despite the differences in their character and background. Together, they organized the work in Los Alamos, where the bombs were designed and built, but it is important to note that the scope of the Manhattan Project was far larger than just Los Alamos, which puts into perspective where the United States was the only country at the time capable of producing such a weapon. First, it is important to note that little actual scientific work was done by the people involved in the Manhattan Project. That is to say, the program was more than anything else an engineering endeavor. By the end of 1942, the science behind the bomb was already established, and basically everyone in the scientific community was aware that it could be made. 
But the main problem that needed to be solved was the production of the fission fuel crucial for making the bomb. In other words, uranium and plutonium. Namely, in order to make the bomb, it wasn't enough to acquire any kind of uranium, which the United States had plenty of, but more specifically uranium-235. Uranium-235 is an isotope of the uranium element where the number 235 relates to the number of neutrons in the nucleus. The main problem at the time was the fact that this uranium isotope was incredibly rare. On average, only 0.7% of the uranium mine in the world was actually uranium-235. The rest of the material was the far more common isotope uranium-238. But the problem with that was that this uranium could not start a nuclear fission chain reaction, which is the main source of energy for an atom bomb. Most of the Manhattan Project revolved around this problem. The United States had to develop an entire new field of industry whose main function was to extract the isotope 235 from the uranium ore at hand, and this was far more difficult than it sounds. But in one aspect, the United States was more fortunate than any other country in the world, but they were able to acquire the purest uranium ore that ever existed. Namely, two-thirds of the uranium ore used for the needs of the Manhattan Project came from the Shinkolobwe mine, situated in the far south of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. On average, uranium ore mined around the world contained somewhere between 1-2% to of actual uranium, but the ore from the Shinkolobwe mine contained anywhere between 20-65%. to The director of the Belgian company that operated the mine, Edgar Sangier, had tremendous foresight and stockpiled the ore in a warehouse in Staten Island, New York, to prevent it from falling into enemy's hands. Colonel Kenneth Nichols, the main troubleshooter and right-hand man of General Leslie Groves, would later on write, our best source, the Shinkolobwe mine, represented a freak occurrence in nature. It contained a tremendously rich iode of uranium pitch blend. Nothing like it has ever again been found. Without Sanjay's foresight in stockpiling ore in the United States and above ground in Africa, we simply would not have had the amounts of uranium needed to justify building the large separation plants and plutonium reactors. But despite the purity of uranium ore, the necessary isotopes still needed to be separated. In the early stages of the program, several methods of separating uranium-235 from the uranium ore at hand were considered. Those were electromagnetic separation, gaseous diffusion, and liquid thermal diffusion. What's important here to understand is that all of these technologies for uranium isotope separation were relatively new and inefficient, and none of them had been previously used even remotely on the scale that was necessary for the needs of the Manhattan Project. In the early stages of the program, a decision was supposed to be made as to which method was to be used to produce the necessary uranium. General Leslie Groves ultimately decided to implement all of them, and the United States spared no expense in order to establish the infrastructure necessary to produce the crucial fission material. In Oak Ridge, Tennessee, three plants were built in 1943 to produce the necessary uranium, each implementing one of the previously mentioned technologies. Uranium had to go through all the three plants in a series in order to achieve the desired result, because each of the three plants were not efficient enough on their own, despite the tremendous investments in each of them. The plant for gaseous diffusion was at the time the world's largest building, comprising over 489,000 square meters. Due to wartime shortage of copper, almost 15,000 tons of silver was used to build the electromagnetic coils for the plant that implemented electromagnetic separation. It is estimated that the plants in Oak Ridge consumed one-seventh of the electricity produced in the United States from 1943 to 1945, and 60% of the entire Manhattan Project budget was allocated for Oak Ridge. But apart from uranium, another element was discovered in 1940 that proved even more prone to nuclear fission than the uranium-235 isotope, plutonium. Uranium and plutonium each require totally different processes to create, both of which were never before implemented on industrial scales. Because there were so many unknowns, and very little time to make the bombs, the key staff of the Manhattan Project decided early on to pursue both simultaneously. In other words, they started producing both plutonium and uranium, hoping that at least one material would be adequate enough to make the bomb. The plutonium production plant was located at the Hanford site in Benton County, Washington. In order to make the plant, the federal government acquired the land under its wartime powers authority and relocated some 1,500 nearby residents. The acquisition, one of the largest in U.S. history. Construction commenced in March of 1943 on a massive and technically challenging construction project which comprised of over 554 separate buildings. By the end of 1944, the plant was almost fully operational. The uranium ore from the Shinkolobwe mine came in handy for plutonium production as well because plutonium cannot be produced without the uranium element. 
During the course of the war, the Manhattan Project grew rapidly, and in total over 600,000 people were employed at one point or another in order to realize the project. Most of the workforce and almost 90% of the budget was for building and operating the plants in order to produce the necessary uranium and plutonium, with less than 10% for development and production of the weapons themselves. The weapons that would later be used against Japan were developed on the other side of the country, in Los Alamos, New Mexico. This area had been recommended for nuclear weapon development by J. Robert Oppenheimer and later approved by Leslie Groves. Together they decided that it would be best if the head scientists involved in the project be relocated from their laboratories and universities across the country to a single location, simply because it would be more practical to control the scientific staff and to not let any vital information seep out. Almost overnight, an entire town was constructed in Los Alamos where a rank school was previously located. The scientists could bring their close family with them, and by the end of the war, more than 8,000 people lived in Los Alamos. The sheer quantity of talent that was selected and brought to the newly built laboratory was without precedent. Numerous members of the scientific staff were went on to become Nobel Prize laureates. Some of the more notable scientists include Enrico Fermi, the father of the atomic age and the man who built the first nuclear reactor, John von Neumann, quite possibly the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, and Niels Bohr, one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century and one of the rare few who proved Einstein wrong. J. Robert Oppenheimer was the director of the Los Alamos laboratory and in the end he proved to be the perfect choice despite his numerous detractors. He organized and ran Los Alamos exceptionally well according to almost everyone there. Even Edward Teller, the genius Hungarian scientist who clashed with Oppenheimer on numerous occasions regarding the use of thermonuclear weapons, later on in life reluctantly admitted that J. Robert Oppenheimer was the best laboratory director he ever worked with. Although certain scientists had greater expertise regarding specific fields of physics or chemistry, no one had the breadth of knowledge that encompassed such a wide variety of disciplines as Oppenheimer, which is precisely the sort of trait one would need to successfully organize the work in Los Alamos. He also frequently worked as a sort of mediator between Groves' sometimes aggressive demands and the needs of the scientific staff. But Oppenheimer would prove to be most valuable when the work in Los Alamos hit an unforeseen standstill regarding the use of plutonium as the fuel for the bomb. First we need to explain the basic characteristics of the bomb type that was initially planned to be used with both plutonium and uranium. Perhaps rather surprisingly, it is actually relatively simple to produce an explosion with uranium. The more difficult part was, and still is to this day, acquiring the necessary fission material, uranium-235. But once you have it, all that is necessary to produce an explosion is in simple terms to hit two pieces of uranium fast enough. Based on this idea, the bomb type that was first developed was the so-called gun-type bomb. This bomb type, which was first theorized in the famous Maud report, is, relatively speaking, rather simple. This design consisted of a so-called gun, or a detonator that fired one mass of uranium-235 at another mass of uranium-235. A crucial requirement was that the pieces be brought together fast enough in order to use the material more efficiently. Once the two pieces of uranium are brought together, the initiator introduces a burst of neutrons and the chain reaction begins, continuing until the energy released becomes so great that the bomb simply blows itself apart. The main drawback of the gun-type bomb was its inefficiency. More specifically, the required amount of uranium was relatively large. But even so, through small-scale experimentation and calculations done by the staff at Los Alamos, it was quickly determined that a uranium gun-type bomb will almost certainly work. But in April 1944, through experiments done at Los Alamos by Emilio Segre, it was determined that the newly produced plutonium contained impurities in the form of isotope plutonium-240, which has a far higher spontaneous fission rate than the more desirable plutonium-239. This meant that the spontaneous fission rate of the plutonium was so high that predetonation was highly likely. In other words, unlike the uranium gun-type bomb, one piece of plutonium would explode before it reached another, and the energy produced would be negligible. Back in early 1943, the possibility of a plutonium gun-type bomb being a dud was considered. Still, priority was given to the gun-type weapon, thinking that a more simple and reliable design had far less uncertainties involved. But Oppenheimer organized a parallel smaller scientific group at Los Alamos under Seth Niedermeyer to investigate a different bomb type as a hedge against plutonium predetonation. A year later, 1944, when it was determined that a plutonium gun-type cannot be made, this decision would pay dividends. 
This second bomb type was far more efficient in theory and needed less fission material to produce a large amount of energy, but it was far more complex, and there were serious doubts whether it could be made before the war was over. This was the so-called implosion type bomb, and by mid-1944 it was clear that it was the only viable option for plutonium. The idea behind the implosion type bomb was to use conventional explosive charges to compress a sphere of plutonium very rapidly to a density sufficient enough to make it go critical and produce a nuclear explosion. The crucial condition being that shockwaves around the plutonium sphere have to go off at the same time with the same amount of force, which brings far greater complexity to the table than the gun type bomb. In the summer of 1944, Oppenheimer quickly reorganized the work at Los Alamos and put far more focus on solving the implosion engineering problem. Physical chemist George Kistiakowski was brought in as an expert on explosives to help design the explosive lenses that were critical for achieving the precise implosion required for the bomb to work. The greatest mathematician of the 20th century, John von Neumann, performed the calculations necessary to design the bomb. Although there were serious doubts in the beginning, in little over a year, the first plutonium bomb was constructed, all thanks to Oppenheimer's leadership, virtually unlimited funds, and immense talent involved in the project. By sheer coincidence, the two main problems of the Manhattan Project have been solved almost at the same time. Oak Ridge and Hamford produced 68 kilograms of enriched uranium and 6 kilograms of plutonium, and the implosion type bomb had been successfully designed, built, and ready for the final test. Oppenheimer and Groves ultimately decided not to test the uranium gun type bomb, because according to all calculations, the possibility of failure was almost zero. Its simple design meant that fewer things could go wrong, but also they did not want to use up all the enriched uranium at hand. If they were to test the uranium type bomb, they would have to wait months before they could make another, and they did not want to waste any more time, given the ongoing war in the Pacific. Because of many uncertainties revolving around the plutonium implosion type bomb, and the fact that they already had enough plutonium at hand to quickly construct another one, they concluded that a test was necessary. In the desert of Jornada del Muerto, New Mexico, the first nuclear weapon test, codenamed Trinity, was scheduled to be held on July 16, 1945. Some 425 people were present on the weekend of the Trinity test. To break the tension, Enrico Fermi began offering anyone listening a wager on whether or not the bomb would ignite the atmosphere, and if so, whether it would merely destroy New Mexico or destroy the world. Oppenheimer himself had bet $10 against George Kistiakowski's entire month's pay that the bomb would not work at all. By 5 p.m. on 15 July, the device called the Gadget had been assembled and hoisted atop the 100-foot firing tower. On July 16th at 5.29 a.m., the test would be conducted. The strength of the weapon exceeded almost all expectations. Instead of the assumed 4 to 5 kilotons of TNT, the gadget created a 20 kiloton explosion. The Manhattan Project proved successful. Ultimately, the United States built the first atomic weapon in the time span that they did because they had some of the greatest minds on the planet striving towards a singular goal, supported by the strongest economy in history. They tried avoiding failure at all costs by producing and executing everything redundantly. Groves went all in from beginning to end, which eventually paid off. Although the Manhattan Project started off as a race to build the weapon before the Germans, as the war grew to a close, it became obvious that no other country even came close to building such a weapon. Even though the Soviet Union had dozens of spies that infiltrated the Los Alamos laboratory, despite Groves' best efforts to avoid it, they tested their first bomb in 1949, five years after the war was over, and even that shocked the world. 